The press conference will be about interviewing the two sailors who are, who are on USS Reagan about two miles from the accident, right through the accident, and their health consequences. Um, and it's going to be very fascinating. You can stay and listen or you can go and get lunch, but this is a press conference which will be open to the press to ask questions, but if there's a lull in the questions from the press, then other people can ask questions as well. That's number one. So if you want to stay, do it. It's going to be fascinating. Americans affected. Second thing is I want at this point to... Um, shh. I want to uh, appreciate uh, the person who's really, really put this together, Marley Lightfoot. She has been absolutely, absolutely extraordinary. Well, I've been in Australia organising all the speakers and the money and the like. Marley's done the groundwork. So I salute you, Marley, and we all thank you very much. Can the sailors come up? And the doctors. Andy, Jeff. So this, um, this press conference is co-sponsored by, um, by the Helen Caldercott Foundation and Physicians for Social Responsibility. The other two doctors who will be involved are Dr. Jeff Patterson, who is the new president of Physicians for Social Responsibility, and Dr. Andy Cantor, who is the past president of PSR. Okay, so just Jeff. So I'm introducing now the two US Navy sailors, Quartermaster Maurice Ennis and Jamie Plim, who both experienced uh, this radiation exposure. I don't know which one wants to start first. You've got 10 minutes to tell your story. Yep. Okay. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Jamie Flim. Um, I'll just kind of give you a chronological timeline of what happened. Um, we were already on deployment in 2011. Uh, we we're about to pull into a routine port call in South Korea. Uh, we go to our navigation brief the night before we were going to pull in um, and we found out that the tsunami and earthquake happened. Immediately we knew that we were going to uh, reroute the ship to Japan to provide aid and um, you know, give them food, water. Um, so we did that immediately. We probably got to the coast of Japan then probably the day after it happened. Um, we never heard anything about a nuclear power plant. We never knew anything about the possibility, let alone any kind of leak. Um, so we were there outside. Our job as quartermasters um, is not only navigating the ship, driving, plotting our course and track, but going outside at the top of the ship to raise flags um, to communicate with other ships. Um, so being outside, we were breathing in this radiation. We were handling flags, which are porous, very porous material, obviously. Um, the ropes that we use to haul the flags up are polyester. So again, a very um, porous material that just absorbed the radiation. Um, we didn't really hear anything for probably a couple weeks after about um, a leak in the uh, power plants, um, and even then it was just still considered kind of a rumor. We, the ship didn't really even go on lockdown, which I mean by that, like no one was allowed outside um, probably until about a month and a half after um, the initial, the, the 11th, March 11th. So. Um, we were outside breathing this in, handling stuff, handling materials, and just absorbing the radiation. Um, I'll let Maurice talk about his um, medical issues that he's encountered, but I'll talk about mine. Um, we didn't finish that deployment until October 2011, so we carried on with our deployment. Um, about halfway through, probably around the summertime, my menstrual cycle just disappeared completely. And then it would come back and disappear and go on and off. And this happened until about the summer of 2012, where it came back in such full force that um, I was in and out of the emergency room. Um, once they 
thought they were going to have to do a blood transfusion on me because I had lost so much. <clears throat> um, they couldn't, I was still in the Navy for this past year. I got out this past January 2013, so I was still getting Navy care for that year. Um, they, I was already on the birth control pill, which I guess they would, they would do to control that kind of uh, menstrual cycle. So the only thing that they could do is say, um, this is called dysfunctional uterine bleeding, and um, we can give you an IUD with hormones in it. And so now that's what I have. Um, it hasn't really stopped it. I still have this issue. And um, now I have to pay for the, the medical costs of that. In addition to that, in February 2012, I developed bronchitis. Um, and then from February to the summer of 2012, I got it six times. I was sent to a respiratory doctor, and it was determined that I developed asthma. So a lot of people um, don't understand that once you get out of the Navy, you don't get any health care at all. Um, if you retire and you stay in 20 years, you get health care. But we only did one enlistment. I did five years, he did four. So we don't, we don't get that unless it's a disability a service-related disability, which dysfunctional uterine bleeding does not really count as a disability as of yet. So we're still fighting that case. And this is also what we're involved in a lawsuit against TEPCO um, for, for medical expenses that we're now having to, we're going to have to pay out of pocket for. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll speed it up, because I know I don't have much time. I'll start with, uh, the beginning of my story where I received the radiation. A part of our job is we have to communicate with other ships using flags and uh, semaphore and Morse code when we're doing special operations. And uh, we store all our flags outside in a weather bag. Uh, we also fly our American flag, our ensign, at the highest point so people know we're the U.S. Navy. I was uh, told by one of the higher ups to go out and retrieve the American flag, so we can give it to the Japanese as a, as a, as a friendship type of deal, like a gift. Uh, I pulled the flag down, it's flapping when it wrapped around me, it got all over me. Uh, I folded it up, I took it down there, I gave it to them, and I'm not sure what they did with it, but I got off watch an hour later. I went to go get something to eat with uh, one of my uh, good friends. We stopped, I used the restroom, and we were just joking around because at the time there were still rumors going around about radiation being on the ship. And uh, we were joking around about my growing extra fingers and toes and stuff like that. And we were like, let's uh, stop and get checked for radiation because they started setting up these little checkpoints all along the ship. And they were saying, it's just a precaution. You don't have nothing to worry about. Uh, if you get some free time, just go get checked out. And we were joking. and laughing and walking over there and he gets checked first and nothing happens he gets his hands checked and nothing happens and he's like smirking like i, I told you this is just a waste of time and i get my boots checked uh, my pants and then my hands and as soon as they get to my hands the machine just goes crazy and instantly like we went from like smiling to uh just being nervous and scared and uh, they instantly told everybody to back away from me. They made a perimeter around me. Uh, and they marched me to a decon station the whole time. They were telling everybody to stand fast, which means stay in your place and back up. And everybody's just looking and freaking out. And uh, I had to hold my hands up, and I had bags on them. And they were telling everybody to contaminate the cell. Everybody just get back, get back. And we make it to the decon station. and. I see there's a huge pile of clothes there from other sailors. And I go in, and they had to remove three layers of skin off my hands and my arms. And it wasn't like back to back. It was, they would scrub off one layer, and then I would have to wash off this orange grit stuff that you used to get off paint and oil. And then they would do it over again, and then check. And we'd start the process all over. So in my head, I was just kind of praying that the machine would stop beeping so I can get it over with. Like, and nobody told me at the time like what was going on. Everybody just kind of told me just to stand there and be quiet and not to touch anybody or anything. 
it was almost like I had to play. And uh, finally, it, it, the machine stopped beeping, and they let me go back to my birthing. And that's when I got to my birthing, they called and asked me to come up on watch to relieve the people on watch, and they told me they had to receive the highest amount of radiation out of anybody on the ship. And then later we found out that our work area, since it was outside, had the highest readings for radiation because of all our flags and all our line that we used to haul up stuff. And uh, they cut off all the area to the rest of the ship. Uh, like two months after, a lump appeared on my jaw and uh, I went and got that looked at by the Navy Medical and they told me that there was uh, nothing they could do about it while we are out to sea that we'd have to wait for us to pull in. And uh, another lump appeared between my eyes. Uh, I have another lump on my right thigh. As soon as I got out of the military, I went uh, back to college and I started playing college sports again. And I actually ran within like three seconds of an Olympic time for my track and field team. And slowly after that, my body just started to fall apart. It's harder for me to breathe now. It feels a lot like my lungs are too big for my, my body whenever I do something like strenuous. Uh, I lost a lot of weight from uh, the time I was in the Navy until now. I got stomach ulcers. Uh, and I, in the last month and a half, my it doesn't look like it, but my, my hair's started to fall out. I try to avoid brushing and combing it. And uh, I'll, I'll wash it like every three days, just because I, I just, I don't, it's like Navy tradition. When you get out, you grow out your hair and you grow out your beard and because you're bald for so long. and it, like, it's just, just falling out, and I don't want to speed that up. So uh, I try to avoid it. And what did you have to sign? Uh, like a little bit after we found out that the ship was radiated and we had finished up helping out, we left the area. And before we pulled into our first port since the disaster, we all had to sign this paperwork saying that the military is not to be held liable for for uh, anything that happened, and we had to sign paperwork saying that we weren't sick, that we were okay, and that they did test on us. And it, it wasn't like a yes or no type of option. It was just like you have to sign it. We personally, like, we never knew that you were supposed to take iodine for radiation. And I later found out that the higher ups, like the CO, the XO, and anybody with like a really important job, they got iodine tablets. The pilots got the iodine tablets, but the general enlisted sailors, they, we didn't get iodine tablets. Uh, we actually had a talk, me and my boss, and I was always a hard worker for him, so we always had like a little friendship, like joke around type of thing going on. And I thought he was joking when he told me, he was like, did you get your radiation medicine? And I was like, radiation medicine? There's, there's medicine for this? And he had a smirk on his face. And I was like, you're messing with me. He was like, I got mine. He was like, you didn't get yours? And I took it as he was just joking around. And then later on, we found out that they had gotten iodine tablets. So. The, uh, one of the hallmarks of the nuclear industry is secrecy, uh, cover up, and minimization. And they keep it a secret, but it sounds like a lot of us kept secret from you, and perhaps still is. Uh, you can't do that, you cover it up, and it sounds like that's happening to you. And then the minimization, uh, if you can't do it first, then it's no harm to you at all. What has happened with your uh, care now? Two questions. Did you ever get a thyroid scan? And have you, um, are you, are you, have your medical records available? What's happened with that? 
Uh, directly after I got out, I kind of, we were told, uh, I hate to say it, but we were all, it was almost like we were brainwashed because we were told that we didn't receive that much radiation, that the amount of radiation we got was the equivalent of standing next to somebody smoking a cigarette, or sun tanning on the beach for a whole day. So I had it in my head that not to worry about it. And it actually, between Jamie crying at night saying, you got to get checked, after more lumps started appearing and everything else, we started trying to get my medical records while, we were sta while Jamie was still in the Navy and stationed in Washington. And they actually lost all the medical stuff uh, that I was involved with around that time. All they had was my records from boot camp, which was like a flu shot and other stuff. No, um, like we said, I was in the Navy for the past year, so I, I, I did see the Navy gynecologist for my issues and the respiratory doctor, but um, they didn't give me any, like I said, they gave me a general term for a diagnosis and, and said, oh, well, we'll just give you an IUD. Um, and he was out the past year. He got a, exactly a year before me. Um, and like I said, without any medical care or any benefits as far as, as this goes, and with him losing his record, we haven't been able to receive any care. So, Maurice, have you ever been examined, uh, fully examined by a doctor? I've never been fully examined. The closest thing I got to it was a couple of months after the scrub, they called me down to medical and they made me uh, sit next to a machine just to see what was going on, and they told me I was good to go after that. And they told me they would keep tabs on me, but it never happened once I got out of the military. Just talk about the helicopters for a minute. Um, the, we were on an aircraft carrier, so the helicopters are the ones that um, flew over onto land and uh, to take food and water and supplies. And they would come back, um, obviously with radiation on the outside of them, so they would come back to the flight deck. And the people in the air department um, had to take, you know, push brooms and soap and water and uh, scrub the sides of the helicopters. And obviously that just drains off into the ocean. There's nowhere for it to go. And that's how they clean the radiation off of the, uh, off of the helicopter. Not only that, but, I'm sorry. Not only that, but we were trying to stay out of the winds, but for us to launch our helicopters, we need wind to lift them off the flight deck. So during the Special Evolutions, we were launching, launching our aircrafts. We had to go into the winds, which meant more radiation. And the ship is now being in port, being decontaminated. Is that the aircraft No, it's a um, it's in dry dock, and they actually just left, I think, yesterday. But they were in dry dock for a year. But it's a routine. Every ten years, the ship goes in there. So Bob Alvarez just has a, something to say. Uh, just very briefly. Uh, Having worked in the energy department, uh, I'm familiar with the assets of the U.S. government arms, and uh, I would not be surprised that the, you were on an aircraft carrier, correct? Right. Yes. Um, that um, the U.S. has aerial radiological monitoring, which the military has on a continual basis, and so does the Department of Energy. And so uh, they have probably done very extensive uh, data collection, including collection of uh, cloud samples, as well as doing uh, remote sensing using lithium germanium detectors, so they could literally take a, a picture of what the uh, energy readings would be coming off the ground as a function of distance and the like. Uh, when the United States exploded nuclear weapons in the open air, there were about 250,000 military personnel with their partner shots. And yeah, it turned out that some of the most highly exposed groups were the ones who were um, maintaining the aircraft, washing them down. Um, the other question I had, did anybody 
did, did they t take any samples of your urine or any of your internal fluids at all? Did you have a whole body count? They didn't do that for anybody on the ship. That's all and they didn't have So um, we should open the uh, matter on the attention of the person who made it. Dr. John Miller, uh, did anybody tell you what dose, cumulative dose, they thought you got in those days? Did they give you any number in milligrams or grams? Uh, when it first happened, they took me down there to the decon station, they're all talking and whispering and talking to each other. And they, I was trying to listen in and I could never hear how much I actually received. But they told me that all the people that was radiated my, later on, my boss told me, well, he was talking to somebody else and he was yelling. He was like, I want to know how did the guy in our department get the highest count of radiation on a ship and he's not even in the air department. And after that, that's when our whole department got sent down there to get tested for radiation. And uh, they locked down all our weather decks, but they never told me the exact number of what I received. So the, in fact, the Navy and the US government absolutely knew uh, what they were being exposed to purposely, yet they can't sue the US government, so they're suing TEDCO for lying to them. But in fact, it's the US government who's lying. Jeff and I, I think Andy would be prepared to go to court to support these people who are suing Tedford. And then Jeff Thank you. Can you say how um, close you were to Fukushima to the nuclear plant and how long you were in the, in the area? We were in the um, area of the coast of Japan for um, about two months. And in that time, we um, went from anywhere from one mile off the coast to 10 miles. And we just kind of went back and forth and did circles up, down, east, west. We um, kind of just kept moving, but we would get one to two miles from the coast very frequently. From the nuclear plant? Right. From, that's, what I, that's what I mean, from the plant. We, we would get one to two miles from it. And and that, so what we did was um, we plotted, um, we have our big charts of the ocean, we plotted the, the latitude and longitude of the plant. Um, basically we drew a, a line 50 miles east of the plant and then, you know, they used some calculation to make a triangle and that was the plume that we were supposed to stay out of, but as we all know that it just floats around, so. We were actually briefed not to like tell the rest of the crew since we did get a lot of information before everybody else because we had to know where we were going and if it was safe and what was the best route to take, not to tell the rest of the crew about the radiation plume or the parameters that we're operating in. So a question about um, uh, were other people hurt or other people speaking up in terms of being hurt and uh, we know formally that the military says you signed the paper and you're not responsible. Is there any sympathy within the ranks of the chain, unofficially, any acknowledgement uh, that you both are sick and maybe other people are? There's um, over a hundred other people involved in the lawsuit. Um, we're the only two that we know of in our, we had a small department and it's just rare for us. We go outside to do the flags and stuff, but it's so small. The rest of the people are from air department. Um, so there are a lot of people, we don't know them personally, it's such a big ship, but um, we're getting to, we're talking to them and everything. And so they, they already came forward um, and they're involved. And um, there's actually like, since our interview last night that aired on TV, a bunch of people have emailed Jamie, like higher ups, like senior chiefs saying that they were sick. And uh, I think they're gonna try to get involved. Uh, a lot of the other people we, we didn't know and we kind of talked to through our lawyer, Paul, and find out about their stories. And is there any attempt, oftentimes when soldiers speak out, they're degraded, they're called sissies, uh, uh, they can't take it. Has there been any kind of attempt to shut you down, to degrade you, to silence you? Not yet. We're afraid of that, but not yet. Um, I think I have a question. You I'm just wondering, have you talked with attorneys about the validity of this evidently coerced waiver that you had to sign? 
Uh, Can it be challenged? Does, from the time you join until you get out, you lose all your rights. Uh, when you actually are just joining to go to boot camp, you have to sign paperwork saying that you're now uh, property of the United States government, so you can't sue them for anything. And then that was just another reinsurance. Our lawyer does have the, he, he does, well, he is aware of it, and um, we're, we're trying to find copies of it somewhere. Yeah. We'll see. Yes. Um, hi, Jane. You said you said that there was about a month and a half that you didn't know that this had happened. Mm-hmm. Right. The children were on the same ship. Yes. Okay. And but yet you said that you were supposed to not tell anyone. Well, so we um, in any kind of situation like that, they cut off um, the cable, internet. Um, phones so that you can't really get rumors, you can't get bad information, you can't share information, just as a protective measure. So we didn't know um, that this had happened. And when they when they did, probably about a month, maybe around a month and a half later, tell us, hey, we need to draw this radiation plume to stay out of, but don't tell everybody else because it's, you know, it's, it's really safe. We're just taking precautionary, and we don't want uh, everybody on the ship to, you know, get all worried and everybody, you know, would cause an uproar of 5,000 people. So. Actually, we were told it, it was a, uh, we never knew that the plants actually blew up. We were told it was a small leak and they were just taking precaution. That's why we were putting it on a chart. And it would be, they would update the digital part. So, because there was digital touch screens all on the bridge of where we were and where the ship was in relativity to land. and. They would update it, our head, our department head, and then they would have us updated on the charts, on the paper charts. So every day, like the parameter would change, and uh, we would put down a new territory or where we couldn't go in. And then finally, it just stayed in that area, and they told us not to go out and add to the rumor mill, because right now they were just taking precautions not to get everybody to get all panicky. Yeah, it, I mean, it's it's very, it's a hard, you know, it's still kind of, like he said, we sometimes are brainwashed into thinking that, oh, everything's fine, they wouldn't do that to us. So it is, a, it's a very, it's a weird situation to be in. When this was going on, there was people trying to commit suicide, there was people trying to get off the ship. Uh, it was like, you're living in fear every day. It is horrible. I think we'll wrap it up now for the media specifically. This is a media conference. Is there any media people who really are you a media person? Yeah, I'm sort of yes, I am. I'm representing the newsletter. Um, uh, I, I just had one question. Do they offer you protective clothing or protective masks? No, the only time um, after we left Japan um, two months later, um, they uh, we did a scrubbed down the ship where everybody went outside with the brooms and the soap and the water and scrubbed the ship down with push brooms. And they, that's the only time we had um, the chemical, biological, radiological suits on. But, yeah, but um, that didn't even have respirators or anything. It was just like a, a jacket made out of a certain material and a pair of pants and plastic boots and pa- plastic gloves. Plastic doesn't stop gamma radiation. I think we should end it now, but for the media specifically, um, these two are prepared to do one-on-one interviews should you have more questions. Uh, We'll do it right here, yeah. You stay here. Thank you.